You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Radio Public, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for September 13th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from Cornfield Resistance Headquarters, where we'll never be a subsidiary of the John Bolton Super PAC, it's The Professional Left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Life holds few guarantees, Drift Glass. What? What? <laughs> You mean that was just sitting in the garage, idling, waiting for him to come back to uh, his not first be, love? Which not is... be a White House employee, and now he reopened yeah. his super PAC today, and he's already endorsed Tom Cotton for real. Oh, oh God, that's nice. So can I go back to grifting now? Yes, you can. Yes, you oh, can. Are, are there <laughs> enough idiots out there to give me money? There sure are. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and it's not, as somebody pointed out to me, I was confused. I had said on Twitter that this is tax deductible. It's not tax deductible. It's tax free to send it to political campaigns, the mm -hmm. money, but uh, donations to super PACs are not tax deductible. So he has a nonprofit 501c3, or he had one that was uh, Goldstone or something like that, Tre huh. not Treadstone, but yeah. <laughs> he had some anti Muslim, warmongering, Russia endorsed. Yeah you know, nonprofit that he had, he was running to for informational yes, education for information purposes, only. Just for know, information. Yeah. Direct mm -hmm. mail. That's what that means. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, John Bolton out at the white house. Uh, it's, it's a sad, sad day when uh, you have to say that John Bolton was the voice of sanity. Yeah. Well, <laughs> in the Trump white house. Know, who, who do you root for in this fight? I, I root for right. the ground to open up and swallow them all. That's exactly right. My big question was, of course, who would break it to Hugh Hewitt? Um, <laughs> and how, as as the most famous cyborg ever sent from the future to destroy America, um, how would Hugh Hewitt, who's not known for his ability to process basic human emotions in any way, how would he reconcile his great love of blood-drunk, warmongering, lunatic John Bolton with his great love of the taste of Donald Trump's ass? and <laughs> what do you do? I mean, I don't know. And of course, no, this really is, though, I, I I thought this when it happened and when they started fighting over whether he was fired or quit. Yes. And John Bolton was texting reporters, including Brian Kilmeade yes. of Fox to say, I quit. I, quit. I was not fired. I, I quit. He didn't dump me. I dumped him. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is the Republican Civil War because there are. Definite Republican hardliners who love John Bolton, have loved John Bolton for years, yes. are more, more loyal to John Bolton than they were to the Bushes or the Cheneys. It's it's a thing uh -huh. out there, especially pe conservatives who want hardline, pro-Israel, do or die, Middle East. Nuke everybody. Warmongering. Nuke everybody. Yep. Um, right. So for those of you who are, haven't been around since the 70s, uh, John Bolton was the crackpot so far to the right of the of the Bush Cheney administration mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. nobody could imagine him ever being given another government job. Right. It was like, oh, <laughs> oh, really? You're going to give I don't know, uh, uh, Free Republic, the the right wing Nazi blog. We're just going to make them the voice of America. You know that that mm -hmm. that is how. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we were writing about uh, the Bush administration and Cheney administration uh, back in the day, and he was such a completely far out crackpot outlier that the idea yep. that this guy would ever be ever be anything like a na the national security advisor of the United States was so dystopian and psycho that it just didn't enter our minds. This could never happen, and of course, that's because my imagination just stops at a certain point. <laughs> because beyond that point it's like oh no no that's just that's hell i just I, why would i why would i waste my time imagining hell if we're going we're going um and then john bolton became this guy who hugh hewitt hugh hewitt loved this guy yeah loved this guy yeah. and uh, you're right this is the this is the uh, republican civil war let's not 
It let's is. Not pre- Absolutely. Let's not pretend it's Trumpism. It's not. Let's not pretend it's no. an outlier. It's not. This is the Republican Party. This is who they've always been. But this also surfaces uh, one of my th- uh, themes, which I've been going over for for years, which is the term conservative and conservatism means absolutely nothing. Right. There it's is completely n- fluid. Completely, completely it fluid. Does it. it literally yeah. is whoever today Sean Hannity says is conservative is a conservative. And the problem you get is when there are two popes, right? You have, right, oh my that, God, that's it. Who do, yeah. who's in charge of the Vatican? There's there's two popes now. And John Bolton is conservative, but Donald Trump is conservative. And the, in the middle, there's Joe Scarborough saying, but Donald Trump's a Democrat. He's a Democrat. You know, he's a Democrat. And that's and I'm why- an independent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we'll, oh boy, will we get to that today. But yeah. the um, the this entire conversation, the whole universe of this conversation is what needs to be swallowed by the earth. Yeah, Everyone yeah. from Bolton to Trump to Scarborough needs to be just sucked and into the core And everybody in between earth. and, and yeah. on the outskirts of that, because it is uh, a series of no ideas versus a series of very, very bad ideas. Yeah. Well, and, and all of them uh, either scampering for cover under the wings of Donald Trump or scampering yeah. to pretend they had nothing to do with the rise of Donald Trump. Yeah. All yeah. of which is a lie. All of which yeah. is just bullshit. Yeah. And yeah. And the fact that these people, the only thing that keeps them in the public eye is money, is the fact that they are deeply embedded in the media and the media has a a vested interest in continuing to pretend that somewhere out there over the horizon, there's a reasonable Republican Party and that somehow they're they're being represented by some of these people who five minutes ago were saying Trump could never win or Donald Trump's my guy or whatever. They're every Republican. Yeah. And now on the phone, Donald Trump. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and when you control the cameras and the lights and the microphones, you control the past. You right. can just pretend I never said this stuff. You can just pretend that Donald Trump was never my friend. You can just lie. And there is no other TV network out there other than Comedy Central. And they're they're busy these days. Yeah. Um, to call you out and say, no, no, you're, you're lying. You're, you're standing in front of a camera. And, and it's this Russian nesting dolls of lying. It's Fox lying every day. And then Joe Scarborough on MSNBC lying, uh, getting indignant and having him and Bill Crystal talk about what a horrible thing the Republican Party turned into five minutes ago. That's a lie. And there's really no truth in here anywhere, except, of course, at the Professional Left podcast, where this is why we're social <laughs> well, outcasts. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, and I do think that there is a democratizing force. It is the same kind of thing that cell phone cameras have brought to police shootings and police yeah. brutality. Yeah. The internet has brought to those of us, you know, on the fringes, really looking in and saying, no, this isn't right. Uh, we do have archives. We do we have do. memory and we do we have do. access to holding on to mm-hmm. No, this really is what you said. This really is what you tweeted. This we have screenshots of what you've done. Right. And when when you bring that up, of course, you're silenced and no one ever talks about you yes, on these there's... on these networks. But uh, at least you have the satisfaction of knowing your audience uh, is aware and yeah. made aware, and you have receipts mm-hmm. uh, that this actually happened. Well, what do you want to podcast about today, Driftglass? I don't know, Blue Gal. I don't know. <laughs> there's just there's a lot of shit out there. Yeah, um, it's, it's. I did want to congratulate you because uh, you really, to the pixel, right? Nailed down Mark Halperin. I did a couple of weeks ago. I did. Uh, I did. You compared him to a former uh, coworker of yours who got yes. a job that you should have gotten, and we yes. can we can play we've that already, out. That we've conversation already done that. Out. <laughs> we've already had that conversation. If you want to do that, there, there was um, there, just to be clear, there was no question about who was qualified and who wasn't for this job. No, this was not and a people in your own off. office were shocked that yeah. this person got the job, but the the way he got the job was to threaten people, right? And uh, it was uncovered this week that Mark Halperin had uh, threatened who was it? Andy Lack, Phil, Phil Griffin, I think. Phil, called, Griffin. Phil Griffin. Oh, that's right. Had had called Phil Griffin and threatened him over. Uh, putting the kibosh on his comeback. Right. Bill Griffin uh, is the president of MSNBC. Yes, right. And so um, uh, when I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, that is exactly the story you told about yeah. your coworker. It, 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 there's no, it is, a, it is boring in the sense that it's always the same thing. It's always mm-hmm. the same mm-hmm. relationship between a weak and feckless leader and an incompetent grifter who has 
the goods on him and yeah. uses that to leverage themselves and do a job they have no business doing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Mm -hmm. If Mark Halpern just would have called me, I could have told him. <laughs> I've called Phil Griffin, I, I don't even know how many times, to criticize him and tell him what he's doing wrong and why the hell is Chris Matthews on the air? And have you ever actually been introduced to Bill Crystal? Are you familiar with anything in his past? But Phil Griffin is a, is a, is a tough guy, man. He will not listen to... Uh, me yelling at him on the phone. I think that was <laughs> Phil Griffin. Might have been a different Phil Griffin. But I know I was yelling at someone on the phone about the fact that they keep hiring fucking Bush regime dead enders yeah. who have no business being on the air and pretending that the Bush administration and the uh, Obama administration never happened. Yeah. So I'm sure Halpern was just like, dude, I'm in your fucking wheelhouse. I'm an asshole. I'm an abuser. I lie all the time. I've been on Donald Trump's lap. And we all pretend the past never happened anyway. That's how we all get away with this shit. So why not just put me back in the lineup? But apparently Mark Halpern was just that big enough of an asshole <laughs> that people said, no, no, there is a, there's a line here. It has nothing to do with your professional competence. Mark Halpern should never be allowed in front of a camera again. Based He's on horrible. his on-air performance, he right. shouldn't be. But then he crossed the line yeah. and abused women and sexually harassed women and tried attempted to trade his powerful position for sexual favors and uh, allegedly uh, hit a woman in a restaurant. So, right. well, uh, then he. Then he called up 75 Democratic operatives, right. who, all of whom took his call, all of whom answered his questions for his stupid upcoming book. Stupid book. And then he, and then he copied and pasted all that, and then he has a book now, and mm -hmm. now we're going to go on my book tour. And uh, how about you, Michael Smirconish? Can you mention? Sure, you're a friend of mine. We'll put Let's it on Let's make here. sure we all notice that his uh, agent is Judith Reagan, yeah. who, who tried to publish If I Did It by O.J. Simpson. Right. So right. Uh, there are some very bad people in this world. Yes. Uh, that's yes, something that has really come to my thought this week uh, in thinking today, with the breaking news today, that last night during the Democratic debate. During the Super Bowl. Uh, yeah. One of the Sinclair affiliates aired yeah. a commercial in which uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's face was set fire to, a mm -hmm. poster of her face was set fire to revealing behind the flames the Khmer what, what? Rouge of Cambodia. Oh, oh my God, really? <laughs> oh, and it's, that's shocking. It's funny if it wasn't so evil. Right. Uh, what we are seeing now, and, and this that's just one example, but what we are seeing now, I think, is the Liz Cheneyfication of the Republican Party. Yeah. We're, go we're, going to, we're going to die with this p power in our hands. And we're yeah. willing to ha to go to bloody stumps on our knuckles to get there. And we're willing to right. risk our political souls and our moral souls to, to hold on to power. We saw this with North Carolina. I think there's just this theme going on of a party that is willing to grab on by the fingernails to power, regardless of how it makes them look in the public eye, regardless of how it damages the national conversation. Uh, regardless of how racist it is, regardless of right. how untrue it is. Uh, you know, <laughs> I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Twitter was just, she she was almost bemused if it wasn't for the fact that she is fielding death threats. Yeah. Uh, well. Of, you know, wow, uh, providing for green jobs and health care is all of a sudden mass murdering <laughs> and leaving skulls right. on the on the dirt road in a third world country. This was the great fear of of the um, uh, South African regime mm -hmm. as they were losing power. Yeah, which was it was never about um, equity. It was about what happens when the people we have been oppressed, uh, who we have oppressed and lied about and abused and tortured and murdered, gain power. Mm -hmm. What will they do to us mm -hmm. once mm -hmm. they have the ability to do to us what we did to mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. That's the that's what haunts them. That's what haunts the Republican Party. That's what they were terrified of after the Bush uh, Bush administration collapse, which was holy shit. What happens when the Democrats do to us what we did to them? And uh, and that's where the uh, that's where the fantasy was born. Like, well, let's all just get along. Yeah, let's all pretend the past didn't happen. Let's all pretend that it's both sides and we're all purple states and we're all going to get along. We're all going to help each other to solve our national problems. And Republicans simply don't have a conscience. They're, they saw that as, really? 
really, I can do all the shit I just did and you're not going to do a goddamn thing about it except forgive me and let me back in the game? Great. Then I'm going to rip your throat out the next time. And now Trump is the next time. This is the thing we promised we would never allow again. We're never going to allow the Bush administration's monsters like this to ever have power ever again. And it became so important to the media and to, uh, frankly, establishment politicians in Washington that the Republican Party Mm -hmm. not be punished for their behavior, that they be forgiven without any atonement, without any redemption, without even any admission that he had ever done anything wrong. They were all suddenly independents. They were all suddenly Tea Partiers. They'd never heard of George Bush, and we're just going to let them walk away. That's the price we're willing to pay for, for national peace. And the only thing Republicans took away from that is, oh, we can, we, can, we can commit murder, and they'll let us get away with it. All we have to do is claw our way back to power. Well, we'll do that by sabotaging and destroying and undercutting right. and lying about the Obama administration for eight years and then nominating the king of the birthers, which is why any candidate, I'm talking to you, Joe Biden, um, who thinks, who, who looks into the camera and, and really sincerely believes, here's what's going to happen. Yeah. I'll get elected in the fever will break and we'll get shit done. It'll be great. You're, you're insane. You're, you're, you obviously don't remember being vice president of the United States for eight years, but I think it's a disqualifying uh, failing on your part, because if you remembered anything about the Obama administration, you would remember that the same people who had their boot on your thro- throat for eight years have been wrecking the country ever since Donald Trump was sworn in. They, and they have no intention of cooperating. They have no intention of playing nice. They keep moving further to the right. And if you can't see that, you don't get to be president. If you can't see that, you haven't noticed that John Bolton's super PAC has endorsed Tom Cotton as of this right. morning. And that's yes. the next step. That's the next yeah. level. Yeah. And you and I were uh, sort of uh, humbled and gratified <laughs> to read a few weeks ago. Do you remember Eve Fairbanks in the Washington Post talking about all of her studies on the Confederacy and yes. the reasonable yes, Confederates who wanted... Yes everyone to get along after the civil war and how the Can language absolutely uh, reflects yeah. people like Ben Shapiro after the oh, yeah. El Paso shooting. Yeah. And it, it really is civility is what is always called for when those in power who have been oppressing right. minorities and sometimes majorities mm-hmm. uh, all of a sudden discover they might lose. Then we call for civility. Then oh, we then, call then for for politeness Let's and reasonable people to reason together. Well, and this is, I, I, you and I talked about this yesterday. I would like to open the door for the Bible bitch to do some, sure. some talking right now. The difference between the uh, the fake saccharine ersatz humility that, that clowns like David Brooks pitch and preach, right. which is the humility of don't judge me. Right. Let's never, nobody judge anybody. Well, yeah, when you're the guy with the bodies buried under his floorboards, of course you don't want people to judge you. <laughs> That's fucking obvious. But I kind of, as the, one, as the guy who's who was looted and robbed and deprived and, and had my country destroyed by you, you're fucking right I want to judge you. That's how we do things now. This is what it's, this is called justice. You wrecked my country. Now you have to pay for it. And, and, the Brooks in humility is no, no, no. Let's all pretend everybody be humble. Don't judge anyone. Well, really? Okay. So you're going to give up your job at the New York times. Oh no, no, no. I'm not going to give up anything I got from my crimes. I'm not going to give up any of my gigs. I'm not going to, the, the, the clowns who hire me aren't going to fire me. No, no, no. I mean, everyone else should be humble about my failures. And, and you and I had a, a good chat yesterday We did about what actual humility what real humility looks like. You were nice because you took me out to a coffee shop a Had couple to. times this week just to get us out of the house. We had kind of a yeah. tough week with some setbacks and and letdowns and, and just thing, things that we hoped would happen yes. didn't happen. And yeah. we're kind of sad about it. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, that's okay. it's okay. We're going to be all right. Um, but uh, getting out of the house and just having a cup of coffee mm-hmm. together does help. I said, you said, I want you to do a Bible bitch this week. And I said, well, I just like to talk about humility. <laughs> and you said, thank you, David, because that word is a, is a trigger for you. Drift class, well, I think. It, it's 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 uh. that it's all of the language that the people on the right have appropriated and, and like civility, like tribalism, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like partisanship. These have all been weaponized by people in on the right to to 
blunt any criticism of the horrible shit they do. You know, when you criticize Republicans, you're being partisan. You're being partisan. You're being tribal. And no, I'm being, I'm observing reality and I'm passing a judgment based on observable facts. And I, I think that that you know, what we talked about yesterday was taking that language back from them. Right. That they have polluted the language. Right. And also understanding that preserving our sanity is a moral good. Preserving yes. our own sanity. and. And there is so much gaslighting and crazy making going on in the middle of uh, very bad behavior and lying and and corruption that mm -hmm. uh, it's important for us to protect our sanity and protect ourselves. Um, and one way to do that and still remain active is humility. And what I mean by humility is what you and I talked about yesterday, which is <laughs> blog roll amnesty day. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's a thing called Blog Roll Amnesty Day w in which some uh, very big bloggers uh, in the early 2000s uh, mm -hmm. decided who had who had uh, a a very large audience within liberal anti Bush blogosphere that they were right. they were big names and they were, big, they were six of them yeah. six big names and they yeah. pretty much linked to each other. Uh, exclusively, ex yeah. exclusively, and uh, they decided to hold a blog roll amnesty day, which we thought at the time might mean, oh, you're going to clean up your blog roll and actually uh, link to people who are uh, maybe not getting all of the attention and are still out there working and writing and noticing things. And uh, it turned out they were just deleting their whole blog roll and starting right. over. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, we're not going to link to you ever again right, at all. Right. So, we're not, yeah. not going to bother with this little people business because th there's now a business model for this and we're just going to move on from – and all you little mm -hmm. people are great, but really this is this is the world in which we operate. Yeah. And we're going to operate whole, at this level rather than at your level. Right. That whole uh, blogging as a democratizing force right. you where – can where live anywhere. You can do falls. anything. Right. No. no. And you no. can be women and people of color. You know, that's also going to go by the wayside accidentally or on purpose. This is now a closed shop. And, and it's white men. <laughs> it's right. white men all of the same age, all of who went to, to elite schools. So, right. uh, yeah. And so that – and and really – as you have no said to me many times, you know you can trust human nature to wind up at that point. You know that oh, yeah. it, it's yeah. Animal Farm. It is. It just is. Um, but what happened then was the late great Skippy, who we just lost, Skippy the Bush yes. Kangaroo. We lost yes. him this year. Uh, mm -hmm. He decided to make Blog Roll Amnesty Day a thing for us. An annual celebration. Annual celebration for us, for the mm -hmm. for the small blogs and smaller blogs. And the point of Blog Roll Amnesty Day on that day when those gigantic blog rolls of the big bloggers was deleted, on that day we would commemorate that by looking up and linking down. Find mm -hmm. five small blogs that gets less traffic than you do, link mm -hmm. and celebrate them at your blog. Yeah. And it was just a, again, bringing it back to a democratizing way of thinking. Right. And I've, I've been thinking about that a lot, just in terms of, we are now focused on who are the top five in the democratic race and who are, who is getting on top of uh, Joe Biden in the polls and, and really focused on some of, of ranking of these candidates and, uh, Politics can be fun sometimes. It has certainly been our obsession for most of our lives. Right. But uh, there is there are local races. There are groups and issues and people who need our help. Um, yep. One thing that I do on a regular basis is try to donate five bucks to Donors Choose, which is um, helping school teachers. You can actually, in Donors Choose, look up the kind of projects you want to fund. And I tend to look for um, young young children with autism who need classroom supplies, uh, and I donate five bucks to that classroom for yeah. for very specific projects. You get to see what the teacher wants to buy with your money, and pooling those resources, everyone chips in a little bit, and then the teacher is able to have those supplies, which will help their students sit still or be calmed 
or be able to read or be able to organize their their day. Um, t- teachers ask. It's it's really interesting. Young t- uh, preschool and early elementary school educators who are working with children of autism always want the same things. They want seating that allows children who fidget a lot or who are uncomfortable in regular chairs to have comfortable seating. They want organizational things that they can post on a wall and still move things around so that the the children involved know what to expect. Pictures of what's going to happen next. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they want language development items, uh, play telephones, uh, little people toys, you know, that you can use to do pretend play. And and so you help you chip in five bucks and you get them those kind of supplies. And yeah. and it's easy to look up by autism lowest cost toys language development seating whatever. Well, and, and you also use your your mighty mighty blogging power I do. to direct I other do. people. I do. I do. Yeah. I go on. I you're able to click a button and send that project to Facebook. All my Facebook pa- teachers, all my Facebook friends can see that. I tweet those kind of things out. Uh, you always want me to talk about the time when a science fiction author. There was Who a, shall remain nameless? a new teacher. Or anonymous. A new te- Who shall remain anonymous? Anonymous. A teacher was looking to buy 20 copies of a very specific young adult novel for his, his classroom. And I, uh-huh. I knew of the author on Twitter. And uh, the author on Twitter had just made a movie deal. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I, said, I just went over and tagged the author and said, you know, you could pay it forward. This one teacher wants 20 copies of your books. And uh, I went back in like two hours later <laughs> and there was an anonymous right. donation. Enjoy the books <laughs> yeah. of buying all yeah. of them. Not five, not a $5 donation. The person had gone from zero to your project is fully funded in an hour. Yeah. And I knew it was the yeah. person who had uh, authored those books. So that's just great. And uh, any, the point is that I am, looking down. I'm looking for someone who is not on the national political stage, who does not have a super PAC or a, a uh, interview with Chris Matthews, you know, can't, can't get um, mic'd up. Right. And trying right. to help that person. And that, that goes for local uh, political candidates that goes for yep. teachers yep. that goes local for causes. Yep. Causes like uh, the other, my other favorite is uh, habitat for humanity. I try to give locally to the local habitat for humanity here in Springfield mm-hmm. um, and UNHCR, which is the international United Nations high commission on refugees. They try to help with financial donations to refugees in their home countries. And uh, so, you know, I'm trying to make a difference $5 at a time, which is how you do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you've got fi- an extra five bucks in your pocket that you can make a difference that way. And that's your, tr- I'm not trying to be a white savior here. I'm trying to humbly no. redirect my energy towards someone who is less fortunate rather than constantly looking toward Donald Trump and what he's doing. Um, right. That doesn't mean I'm not paying attention, but for sanity's sake, I can make a difference to one teacher, to one kid, to one refugee with my $5 contribution. So, right. And well, I mean, we just had middle child come back from a, a mission trip, right. Which was not preaching the gospel to the, right. to the folks. It <laughs> no. was, it was building a house. Yep. Um, she and was she, building a habitat for humanity house. Yeah. And uh, they went, and then they went camping. They, they nailed and uh, cut a blue board, did that for four days. And then they went camping for a long weekend and yeah. uh, had a great time and made a difference for one family. And, and the they people, got to meet the family. They yeah. they did get to meet the family that they were building the house for. And so. there's a parallel trip that works with very small children, and they do that every summer. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, so there are plenty of ways. And and the reason this came up is uh, I'm not going to get too specific, but between you and I, we have several degrees. Yep. Uh, and about 25 years of professional experience at high level management, project management. Not, you know, I mean, we're very good at this sort of thing. Um, and right now, if we're very lucky, we might be able to land work as a secretary or a stock boy. At a That's local what we're store. looking at. Yeah. And yeah. Because we're... they're just, you know, for various reasons. However, there are millions of people who don't have the tools we have, who mm-hmm. are worse off than us, who, who have less opportunity than we do, who have less skills than we do, who are less capable of negotiating their way through complex bureaucracies. Um, the, the way that, that um, paying it forward in a way manifested itself was – 
junior dude uh, mm-hmm. got into a little bit of trouble uh, <laughs> because of a, a license plate. Yeah. Um, yeah. He had the he had the skills and the training, and he has a, he has autism, which which you all know, um, and the wherewithal and the confidence to march into the bureaucracy and get it straightened out. Yeah. Which would scare. They made a mistake with right. their parking ticket. Yep. Yep. And which would scare the hell out of lots of people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the idea is we we do have, and most of our listeners do, I'm sure, have an enormous amount of skill and training and gifts and so forth. And there's lots of places to put them where you can see a tangible good being done. You're not, again, you're not coming in as the white savior. You're coming in. Mm-hmm. A, a friend of mine this week asked me for job advice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was able to help him with some sort of just questions, just a little Q&A back and forth. A local event needed someone to set up chairs um, and a tent or two and, and take you know, tickets. Happy to help out because I believe in the cause. It was, to, it was to help raise money for a local school. Those things are available to you in your community. And they, they make a huge difference in the people's lives. And they involve using your gifts in ways because looking up, I'm gonna, I'll, just, I'll dip back into our list now and seeing that Ben Howe, for example, uh, ben Howe is a right-wing goon who worked for Red State for a number of years. So he's been feeding out of the wingnut welfare trough for his entire life. Uh, but he's disappointed. Uh, he is disappointed with how Jerry Falwell Jr. has besmirched the good name of Jerry Falwell Sr. and Liberty University. <laughs> um, and and now he has a book. <laughs> and mm-hmm. now... And now and he's on cable TV and here, oh, look, Joe Scarborough welcomes Ben Howe. Are you going to talk about your long history of being an awful, shitty human being? No, of course not. I have a book and I, it's all about how the good old days of the moral majority, you know, and, and that is the kind of thing where that is so far out of my, I, I can see it. I can write about it. I can comment on it. I can inveigh against it. I can shake my fist, but I can't do anything about it. Ben Howe's not going to listen to me. Joe Scarborough has never listened to me. Um, so I can focus attention and, and hopefully bring some vocabulary to this discussion that makes it clear what the problem is and how we as a group can change it. But what I can do, what I really can right. manifestly change in the world is I can help out at a school. I can help clean up a street near my house. I can help people with, um, they're, they're tackling homeless issues in my town. I can help out a little bit with that. Those are the things I can do. And when I'm doing those things, I don't sort of ruminate on all the things I don't have and all the jobs I don't get and all the. Right. Because because I will tell you, times are times are tough for us uh, in terms of the employment picture. And we're is it okay for me to talk about? Sure. Yeah. Just you had you had a a good job interview a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Very good. Very good job. And very good job interview for something you were eminently qualified to do. You've been looking for for, or wanting to find a full-time employment for a long time. You've had very Mm -hmm. little full-time employment since the recession. And the reason I bring all of that up, a decade, the reason I bring all of that Mm -hmm. up is, as I've said to you before, personally, uh, you are so not alone. And there are so many people in our situation between the age of 50 and retirement age Mm -hmm. who can't find a job who can't find the kind of job they had before 2008 and uh, can't find a lot of people can't find any work except for Uber driving or stock boy or secretary. Pizza delivery. There's a lot of senior citizens delivering pizza in our town. And it's not because they have nothing better to do with their time. Right. It's because they need the money. Right. You know, and that's, that's the truth. And there is a lot of age discrimination out there. And, uh, and just, people not wanting to hire someone with a whole lot of experience because that's expensive. And uh, the culture in some offices is we don't want someone who's smarter than the boss. Uh, Anyway, all of that aside, um, having, having sort of taken this kind of assessment this week of, do I go get a job registering people in a hospital, you know, rather than uh, just trying to live on, a tip jar, which is what we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's hard. And these kind of decisions are being made all over the country. And that's why I talk when I talk to you in the coffee shop about, you know, what are we going to do and how are we going to do it? 
remembering humility and remembering to help those less fortunate really does help you keep your sanity in that way too. It really does. Um, anyway, uh, and eventually, thank you, Driftglass. Eventually, thank you, Driftglass. one of these, eventually, one of these people that we help is going to get that twelve hundred, twelve thousand, one hundred twenty thousand dollar Yang check from the debate. <laughs> <laughs> and and then we're going to be in Biscuit City, honey. Then it's gravy Biscuit as far. Biscuit City, everybody. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, do you want to talk about the debate at all? Sure. Since... Well, if you want to, um, it it is still too many <laughs> candidates. Everybody says that. Uh, yeah. And and I am glad that they are still pushing back on the Republican framing of these questions. They right. didn't do it as much last night as they have done before. Mm-hmm. But George Stephanopoulos was insufferable. Mm-hmm. Um. And it, I think it really is time to turn the tables on these questions and say, all right, let's 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 get a very specific example. George Stephanopoulos, how much do you make a year? Yes. Okay. Yes, your taxes are going to go up. Yes, your taxes. The same kind of ferocity that Beto O'Rourke used about guns. God damn it, you're right. We are going to take away your AK-47s. Uh-huh. We are going to take away your AR-15s. Yeah, God damn it, Joe Scarborough. We know that you know the date and time that you stop paying payroll taxes. Right. And it's before Martin Luther King Day. Right. <laughs> you don't pay payroll taxes for eight weeks because you make so much money. And yes, you're going to pay payroll taxes for longer. We're going to tax you back to the Stone Age. <laughs> we're going to tax you back to the Stone Age. Yeah, that's so what we're going to do. You're going to give up a little piddle of your wealth, a little more piddle of your wealth so that everyone can have health insurance because that is a moral good for this country. Well, and I really do think, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I think there's a... a it is time. This is I've seen um, uh, Nancy Pelosi do this a little bit, and I've seen Beto mm-hmm. work do this a little bit. Which is, it please Democrats listen to me when I tell you it's time to go after the media. It's time to go after the press. Donald Trump has made a hay going after the media for all the wrong reasons. Right. He he knows that they're very unpopular. He knows that people hate them. He knows that he, his people especially hate them. What Democrats don't seem to understand is that we on the left really hate the media too, but for very <laughs> different reasons, very, yeah. very different reasons. And, and so when asked a question about taxes, um, my answer would be, if I were up on the stage and I never will be is, you know, what's really weird, George, is that your people in your profession have no fucking interest in taxes at all. When Republicans are running up the deficit or breaking the economy, you never ask them what things cost. You never mention it. When Bush and Reagan ran up giant deficits, I never heard anybody talking about taxes. The minute Bill Clinton's hand hit the Bible, it was, oh, now you can't raise taxes. You're not going to raise taxes, are Because taxes are going up. You'll ruin the country if you raise taxes. George Bush, the same thing. I didn't hear a peep out of you sons of bitches when George Bush was lying in the wrong war, wrecking the economy, burning through the Clinton surplus. Minute Barack Obama's in office, what about taxes? Are you going to raise taxes? Are taxes going up? It's time for us to stop playing this stupid game that you people in the media want us to play. So here's my answer to you, George. You know who's going to pay for Medicare? The Mexicans are going to pay for it. Mexico's, Mexico's going to pay, pay for, for it. it. <laughs> and I dare you to ask me a one goddamn follow-up question. Go ahead. Ask me. Well, what do you mean? I mean, Mexico's going to pay for it. How are they going to do it? They're going to do it. Why? Yeah. Because I'll make them do it. Because I said so. Mexico's going to pay for it. And then yeah. you turn to the audience and say... Who's going to pay for your Medicare? Medicare for all. Mexico. <laughs> and who's going to pay for it? Mexico. And just keep chanting it over and over again until someone somewhere in the media starts to notice how ridiculous it sounds and how utterly And how dependent. they swallowed it. And how, and how they, they swallowed, swallowed it. it. Yes. And how they, they walked away from the basic responsibility of journalism because they knew the people they were dealing with were fascists. Mm-hmm. And would and would and would lie to them and would happily punch their fucking lights out if they asked too many questions. So they were happy to stand in a pen and have people spit at them and throw things at them so they could go back to their boss with some sound clips from a rally. But at no point did they ever push back hard on the narrative that, well, why are you voting for someone who's obviously lying? Because you know what the answer is. The answer is Republicans are terrible people who lie to themselves and everyone else all the time. That is plain and obvious truth. This is what's heartbreaking to me. The plain and obvious truth that the Republican Party is the problem Mm -hmm. is something that no one on the debate stage is willing to say. And that's freaking me out a little bit because you're running against the Republican Party. You're running against Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump and the entire Republican apparatus and Fox News, and you all goddamn well know it. 
why won't anyone just say it? And the answer, ha- and you'll you'll ask someone a question about um, health care or gun control, and what do you get? Except for Beto O'Rourke, you'll get, well, it's it's leaders in Washington, and it's Congress. There, there were 145 CEOs this week who signed a letter insisting that the Congress pass some sort of gun control. I read the letter. The words Republican and McConnell and Trump are never mentioned in the letter. Unbelievable. They mentioned Congress no, and the totally Senate. predictable. Over totally, and over again. Totally predictable. Yep. Why? Because the 145 CEOs are fucking cowards. Right. Because they live in a business world where you dare not piss off mm-hmm. your customers. Because your customers are the assholes who are voting for Mitch McConnell. So we can't say it out loud because that's scary. So we'll just say it's leaders in Washington. It's the system. Well, guess what? That's, that's an invitation. For Donald Trump to win again, because who is he running against? Mm-hmm. He's running against Washington. Mm-hmm. Those people over there are the problem, and I'm the strong man who will solve the problem. And until you start calling out the Republican Party as a party, and you start calling out Beltway media journalists yeah, but by name. Class, I think, no, I think yes. what we're missing here is that certain presidential candidates uh-huh. understand that their audience is the Democratic base, yes. is you and me. And those people, those candidates, are not afraid to call out the Republican Party, are not afraid to mention yes. Mitch McConnell by name. Less there are course. other presidential candidates who are less experienced, Pete mm-hmm. Buttigieg, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> uh, who actually, I think, are a little bit mixed up as to who their audience is. And they want the approval of Chris Matthews. Mm -hmm. They want the approval of Joe Scarborough. And that that free media is worth something to them. And it definitely is. It It definitely is worth something to them. Free media got Donald Trump elected. Their audience, right. Free media Mm -hmm. got Donald Trump elected. So don't forget that. Mm -hmm. That that is a choice. And if your audience is the Chardonnay parties where Chris Matthews and Joe Scarborough go then you're going to behave in a very different way. And you are going to talk about Washington and politicians and generic because you're selling to that audience. If you're, if you're bypassing that audience, that's going to cost you in a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, But it is more attractive and you may win Iowa as a result because your audience is the democratic base who votes in primaries and caucuses. Well, I mean, Claire McCaskill's not running for anything, but every time she's on television, it's about leaders in Washington and Congress. Right. right and so right. there is because an... she's still in the red state Missouri mold. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And and also, who's her boss now? Yeah. Well, Joe right? Scarborough basically. Joe Scarborough basically, Joe basically Scarborough is her boss. Is the so... person who can turn her on and off, who can give right. her TV time or not. Right. And and Brian and, but... Williams can give her TV time or not. Yep. And and the and so there are two different realities running side by side, or not realities, mm-hmm. but two different two different um, behavioral models running side by side. Right, One is right. the media pretending the Republican Party doesn't exist, mm-hmm. and the, uh, Mitch McConnell mm-hmm. is 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 somehow and Donald Trump are just one offs. And and uh, this week uh, there was this important crossover episode <laughs> between these two <laughs> things because and because I'm going to very specifically say uh, we we had I'm not going to go into detail because that would be wrong. We had words at our home about Ben Sass once upon a time. We did. Um, and I'm not going to say anything more than that. I, I think uh, we've talked about this before, actually, on the podcast. So I don't think it matters much. But basically, my ex-husband, with whom we tried to remain cordial, uh-huh. uh, decided to give Junior Dude Ben Sass's book for his birthday last ben year. Ben Sass's book, title, title is Them, Why We Hate Each Other and How to Heal. Uh-huh. And, and it's a very and, yeah yeah well so Ben Sass is a senator from Nebraska, uh, who really really wanted to talk about tribalism and both sides <laughs> and the corrupt duopoly and really really didn't want to talk about Donald Trump, which is pretty much most Republicans and Libertarians they don't want to talk about Donald Trump they don't want to talk about the 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 monster they created so they do every at every possible opportunity they divert the conversation over to tribalism and everyone's wrong. I can't we all look and Ben Sass's book is full civility. of bullshit. civility. Yeah. yeah. I was at a stoplight the other day and I said, I noticed they do a stop and we go and the traffic comes back and forth and we all get along. Why can't America be like that? Uh, you know, that's his book. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. You've just read Ben Sass's book. So it was a very popular Christmas gift among NPR Republicans 
who still like to pretend that it's both sides. And here's a little thing. Here's a little something from this week in the Washington Post. May I read you? Oh, you may. Headline, Ben Sass's predictable journey from never Trumper to winning Trump's endorsement. <sighs> Anyone who hoped Senator Ben Sass would be the next Bob Corker, one of the leaders of the anti-Trump movement from within the Senate, gave up on that a long time ago. And on Tuesday, the senator from Nebraska and par parenthetically maybe former never Trumper got what he ostensibly wanted with his delicate dance around Donald Trump since then a coveted tweet endorsement to protect him from a pro-Trump primary challenger. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. all, it's the entire, I can't say it, stress this enough, it's the entire Republican Party. And any one of them who's ever been in the Republican Party going back to the 90s, who's, who's willing to squat on a stone in front of a camera and tell you that it's both sides, that civility is important, let's all be humble, is they're the, they're the disease carrier. They're the ones you can't trust. They're the ones who aren't honest enough to say, yeah, we're a bunch of Nazis. We love it. They're the ones who really who are, who are coming after your money, who are coming after your vote, who will tell you the most seductive lie possible. They can't pretend the Republican Party isn't the Republican Party anymore. That's gone. Mm -hmm. The only thing these clowns have left is it's really tribalism in both sides. Can't we all get along? But eventually they all climb up Donald Trump's ass and die. And that's... That's because they don't have a conscience. If you were a Republican in the Republican Party in the 21st century, you don't have a conscience because that's who you, that's that's the team you joined. Which brings us to the story of Gregory Cheadle. Gregory Cheadle, we're going to really quickly go through this. Yeah. Uh, Gregory Cheadle, you won't recognize his name, but you may remember no. the time when Donald Trump called him my African American over here. This is yeah, my for... African American. Yeah, uh, on the tarmac, and uh, he was. He is a a Donald Trump supporting African American Californian yep. Republican. Yep, and uh, he was at this Trump speech, and you know, honored guest, whatever. Donald Trump pointed to him and said, "Look at my African American over here." Uh huh. And uh, he was in the news this week because he's fed up with Donald Trump and the Republican Party. I'm fed up with the Republican Party and Donald Trump because you know why? Because apparently they're full of racists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'm going to read this to you. It's uh, the man President Donald Trump once used as a My African American stage prop now says the GOP is pursuing a pro-white agenda and uses <gasps> and uses black people as political pawns. I wonder when he figured that out. Somewhere Michael Steele just woke up from a long <laughs> slumber. Yeah. Yeah. After two years of frustration, <laughs> yeah, with the two whole years, two whole years of two frustration, years of frustration with the president's rhetoric on race and the lack of diversity in the administration, Cheadle told PBS NewsHour. I mean, right there, that's just, wait for it. That, Here it comes. That's not the punchline. Cheadle Here told it comes. PBS NewsHour. He has decided to leave the Republican Party. <gasps> oh, really? Yes. And, and run, and, and sell shoes? run for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives as an independent. Say it, I'm Say an it with me, everyone. I'm an independent. <laughs> now, guess what? I am. I'm an independent. I'm the same asshole I was a minute ago, but now I'm calling myself an independent. So you can't catch me. You can't touch me. So Gregory Cheadle is 62 years old. <laughs> And it only took Gregory Cheadle 62 <laughs> fucking years to notice that the party that he'd sworn allegiance to was full of racists. This came as a shock to Gregory Cheadle. Now, why did Gregory Cheadle believe that he can take off his tap dancing shoes and unwrap his mouth from around Donald Trump's ass and suddenly decide, I'm an independent. I am shocked at what went on the GOP. Why does he think that that's going to happen? Because of Ben Sass. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody, every asshole in the media, every former fucking Republican who wants to continue their career ripping off the American public and lying to people and sabotaging the Democratic Party from within and without calls themselves a fucking independent. Yep. That's why. And they get and away with it. it. Work. And they get because away the with minute, it. Yeah. Because the minute someone starts questioning the, the, the credentials of any independent, all independents are threatened. Yep. So That's they have right. to all pretend, yeah. oh, no, he's cool now. He's cool. Joe Scarborough, he's an independent. He used to be a Republican two minutes ago. But now he's independent, so we can trust him. No, you really can't trust him. The minute you turn your back on him, you're going to lose a kidney. 
And that's well, that's Joe the Scarborough fact. this morning. Medicare for yes. all is never going to happen. Yes. He's absolutely convinced of that. And he will yes. bark that from his podium on MSNBC and, yes. until he retires. That's it. Mm-hmm. Can I can I talk about grandma in the newspaper today? You go you go. Girl. I, it's you talk not about newsworthy to anybody but me, probably. But no. I it no. we have talked many times about the death of newspapers. Yes. And have. one of the ways that newspapers are making ends meet is with uh, remembrances, weddings, obituaries, and this kind of paid content that is a tribute to someone for whatever reason, the life, a life stage, right? And uh-huh. uh, obituaries in particular are expensive. Uh, if yeah. you want to put yeah. a long obituary in the newspaper, they charge you mm-hmm. a lot for that. Mm-hmm. And the, way, the reason they do that is it, it's money in the bank for them. So I was looking through, you know, the seven pages of today's newsletter newspaper that we get. And, and there were several memorials to people who died 10 years ago or died 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And we remember you, Grandma, you know, and there'll be a little black and white photo. We remember you, Grandma, who died 10 years ago today. Here, signed Joe and all the grandkids, whatever. And someone paid to put a picture of grandma in the paper and remember her. Good for you. I have no criticism of that whatsoever. That's lovely. Not at all. Uh, But this particular one at the top of the page of memoriams was two columns wide, seven inches of space, two columns wide, color picture, Mm -hmm. uh, and a poem of, and I'm not going to read all of it, but it goes, God saw you getting tired and a cure was not to be. So he put his arms around you and whispered, come to me. And it goes on. And then it says, forever in our hearts, we love and miss you. Right. And it's got family, first names of the family members. Mm-hmm. Terrific. Again, no problem with any of this. No problem with any of this. You're remembering your grandmother. I cannot criticize you in any way for remembering your grandmother. God bless you and God bless your family. Mm-hmm. This Five by seven color photo that they paid a mint to put in the in the paper today is a picture of Granny with thumbs up at the slots machine. Yeah, <laughs> she's playing slots. Grandma's a slot jockey. She's a sl- she was. <laughs> yeah, she's gone now, but yeah. not forgotten. But as all, a slot jockey, all the pictures we have of Granny. <laughs> that's the one. This is the one. She's got her thumbs up, and she's at the slot machines, and uh. <laughs> I read this whole poem to you and sh- and then told you the punchline about the slot machines. And you said, I could write a better poem than that. Right. As long as I, uh, now I have a theme to work with. I have cover <laughs> art. I can do, give me five minutes. <laughs> so I took five minutes. And uh-huh. what I wrote was, life gave granny lemons. She deserved lucky seven. So God sent her cherries to slot machine heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> and. God bless Granny and her. She apparently had a really great time at the slots. Yeah. See, my my grandmother, <laughs> my grandmother Naomi, bless yeah. her, long long since passed away. Oh, was she the one that loved bourbon? No, no, that was my aunt. <laughs> that was my aunt oh, Ray. Okay. My aunt Ray loved aunt. bourbon. Okay. My my yeah. grandmother cheated viciously at double solitaire. Oh really? Uh, she, she had oh a, she, my gosh. She had such a you know such an honest grandma face, and then she'd see <laughs> a play on your side of the table, and she'd reach across, put her fingers on the cards so you couldn't put there, and then slide hers under and look at me like, "What? I'm your grandma." <laughs> <laughs> so, I, sadly, there are no pictures of Grandma Naomi cheating at. I think she cheated at Kings of the Corners too. Um, I'm not sure oh, about that. Oh lord, we were a card playing family, but um, I. You know what? I get it, and I'm sure the sentiment is sweet. Uh, and and but really, that's the one you chose. That's great. I have no problem with that. I'm glad you're keeping the newspapers doors open for one more day. Uh, but that's local news, man. That is local news. It really is, and and funny as hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I want to read a letter, if you don't mind, from a listener that sure. came this week, and then we'll get on to the news roundup. Uh, we got a letter from Christina. And uh, you and I both said when when we looked at it, oh, this would be a good one to read. Uh, uh-huh. Christina writes, I'll try not to make this ridiculously long and don't expect big things as far as punctuation. Great. I love the podcast and hearing people actually tell the truth and holding both sides feet to the fire. The distinct lack of courage from the both sides crowd makes me cringe. 
I grew up in the South. I've been in the Midwest for 30 years. My neighbors are all Republicans. They are always there for me in a pinch and I am there for them. I don't hesitate to ask them why in the hell they vote Republican when they all work for a living. They repeat back the same tired lines I've always heard from conservatives. I remind them that the GOP is a restricted club for the white wealthy and they are not in the club. They will never be in the club. Most of the time, their response involves a comment related to abortion rights. Right. Yeah. (sighs) When I registered to vote at 18, I registered as a Republican. My older Mm -hmm. brother was a Republican and he worked on Gerald Ford's campaign back in the day. My dad was a Republican and a very conservative Baptist. He served 25 years in the Air Force. He escaped ignorance and poverty when he joined the military at 17. Dad was the only kid of six to earn a college degree. Mm -hmm. He believed in God and country, and he would have despised Donald Trump. He didn't like cruelty. A man born and raised in the cotton fields of Louisiana was repulsed by Americans waving the Confederate flag, and he never mistreated a human being because of the color of their skin or sexual orientation. He did not believe that his Bible allowed for such behavior. He passed away in 1990. I can't imagine the horror he would have expressed as seeing what Trump is doing to the country. He couldn't stand men that were disrespectful toward women. I certainly didn't agree with him on many things, but I continue to be proud of the kind of man he was and how he taught me to be strong and speak my mind, no matter who agreed with me. My mother was born in Germany. And she and her family were stuck in East Germany after the war. She escaped in 1951 at the age of 19. She was a border jumper and she made it to West Germany where she managed to survive and find a job and send money home. She didn't know if she would ever be able to see her family again. Eventually she did, but that's a story for another time. She was a rock, an absolute rock. I had amazing parents. They had flaws and warts like us, like us all, but I was so lucky to have them. She didn't speak a word of English when she came to America with my dad and taught herself by the time my oldest brother was a year old. When I was about 22, I got a job at Planned Parenthood. I was surrounded by people who thought and voted differently, totally differently than me. I kept my ears open and my mouth shut. I learned a lot. My dearest friend came out to me as gay. My oldest brother and I watched what the GOP and Gingrich did to Bill Clinton and the stomach-turning hypocrisy of the Republican Party, and we both walked away and never looked back. I'm 49 now, and I wouldn't vote for a Republican if my life depended on it. My brother passed away young from a terrible form of cancer. His son was six years old at the time, and I was determined that his son was not going to grow up with a small mind from living in a small town in the Midwest. I'm very proud to say that young man voted for Hillary Clinton in his first presidential election. He rocks my world. You both rock my world too. I love hearing Drift Glass bring the hammer down and call out all the bullshit. That's my kind of Democrat. (laughs) I, I believe we are fighting for our lives and our country in a way we have never had to before. Mm-hmm. kudos to you both i'm off to donate to your podcast oh, i wish you. i had a lot more money to give thanks for everything you do christina thank you christina thank and you so uh much, christina. you know every small donation pooled together makes a mm-hmm. difference to us it does. and uh you never have to wish you had more to give us uh we're just grateful to hear from you and uh grateful for your support so thank yeah, you those, for that and a reminder to everyone out there we haven't said this in a while that if you are uh, in, in dire straits, if, you, if money's tied at your place, this is our gift to you. This is yeah. what we can do. Yeah. So. And and if you're an active duty military, don't you dare give to us. No. no. <laughs> you want to send us stickers from Germany? Yeah. Uh, or, yeah. Or, uh, or 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 a uh, pastry? Uh, <laughs> yes. That's fine. But you don't owe us a damn thing. I mean, right. This is this is for you, and it's, it's our it's our pleasure and delight to do it. Right. Right. So, Drift Glass, should we do a news roundup? Yeah. There was plenty of news this week, and. Uh, you probably read a lot of it, but we're going to give you a short capsule of what we think was the most important stuff that happened this week. Thanks to the Trump administration's efforts to undermine the Affordable Care Act and eliminate protections for people with pre-existing conditions, this country's uninsured rate grew significantly for the first time this decade. A deep dive into the Republican tax cuts show they have done virtually no good to the economy. Hey, you know, Donald Trump ordered Mick Mulvaney to have 
the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, repudiate a tweet by weather forecasters that contradicted his statement that Hurricane Dorian posed a significant threat to Alabama. Mulvaney then dumped the problem on Commerce Secretary and dried Apple performance artist Wilbur Ross, who threatened to fire top NOAA employees if they didn't back up President Stupid. Those are your tax dollars at work. All those people get paid. Yep. Like a salary. <laughs> we big don't salary. get a salary, but those big, people. Mick Mulvaney and, and uh, yeah, dried apple performance artist Wilbur, Wilbur Ross. Ross get paid yeah. out of our tax dollars. And they, yeah. they get really nice slippers, apparently. Apparently, Wilbur Ross is having custom-made slippers uh, all the time. Commerce yeah. Department slippers made for himself at... Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, remember him? He says he's broke. <laughs> mm-hmm. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can think of some things Milo Yiannopoulos could do for money. I, I can think of a lot of things he do for money. <laughs> One thing, maybe maybe he could get a job driving Mike Pence across Ireland because Mike Pence's family junket to Ireland cost taxpayers nearly $600,000 in limousines alone. Trump memorialized 9-11 by attacking the Washington Post Amazon ABC over an unfavorable poll. And then once again, he lied about being a first responder at 9-11. I went down to ground zero with men who worked for me to try to help. In fact, Trump did not go down to ground zero on 9-11. But he did call into a local TV station to brag that he now owned the tallest building in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And we have that on videotape. And your Republican friends all voted for this asshole. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Trump administration will not grant temporary protection status to people from the Bahamas whose lives have been destroyed by Hurricane Dorian. The Trump administration, and we use administration in quotation marks, by the way, um, repealed Obama's landmark clean water protections that had placed limits on polluting chemicals that could be used near streams, wetland, or other bodies of water. Donald Trump also said that the water was cleaner 25 years ago because there weren't so many people around. Right. In 1994. Uh, In case you were wondering about elections mattering, this is literally about the amount of poison that gets to be dumped into your water. Uh, The Supreme Court, the conservative Republican Supreme Court, ruled the Trump administration can continue to deny most Central American migrants from seeking asylum in the U.S. while a legal battle over that issue plays out in the lower courts. The FBI and other federal agencies accused Israel of placing cell phone surveillance devices near the White House within the past two years. Trump says he doesn't know how this could be true. I don't know how this could be true. This can't be. This is probably not happening. (laughs) This is probably not. Uh, That's crazy. The president Uh, is an idiot. All right. The the U.S., well, he's also in the pocket of so many foreign potentates and powers that we've lost count. The U.S. deficit, which used to be of interest to Republicans, uh, surpassed the one trillion mark in the first eleven months of this fiscal year, up nineteen percent from a year ago, and exceeding one trillion dollars for the first time since two thousand and twelve. Remember during the recession mm-hmm. when the bottom dropped out of the economy and and we had this massive problem? Yeah, um, we're not in a recession now. The only thing that's causing this is Donald Trump's massive fucking tax cut for rich people, which is doing absolutely nothing. For the rest of us, except wrecking the country and driving a bunch of farmers bankrupt and a few other odds and ends. The House Judiciary Committee approved a resolution defining the rules for its impeachment investigation into Trump. Yeah, this that one bothers me because it's so lawyerly. It's not being handled well from a PR standpoint. Yeah, no, yeah, no. And that really, really bugs me. Uh, Beto O'Rourke can talk about guns in a blunt and honest way than House Repub- House Democrats can talk about impeachment in a blunt and honest way. And somebody needs to. Somebody well, should have been up on that debate stage last night saying Donald Trump needs to be impeached yesterday and the House needs to get off their asses and say, we are going to impeach this lawless administration come hell or high water, period, full stop. Uh, Donald Trump's trade war with China has reduced U.S. employment by three hundred thousand jobs through a combination of eliminating jobs by companies struggling with tariffs and jobs that would have been created but weren't because of reduced economic activity moody's analytics forecast that the job toll will hit four hundred and fifty thousand jobs by the end of the year donald trump called on the boneheads at the federal reserve to lower interest rates to zero or less so that that would effectively lower his taxes by millions his, and his millions interest rates on all dollars. the loans he has right uh-huh 
So save him personally. Money. Andrew Yang announced a $120,000 giveaway during last night's Democratic primary debate, which got to give it to him, man. You're just buying votes. Yeah. Good for if you, you, man. If just... you uh, win that, guys, uh, be sure to give a little bit to the Professional Life podcast. Oh, a little love. <laughs> Trump announced that he fired his national security advisor who insists that he resigned. John Bolton, disputing Trump's version of events, tweeted, I offered to resign last night, and President Trump said, let's talk about it tomorrow. Trump, meanwhile, then tweeted, I have informed John Bolton last night that his services are no longer needed. Because he can't fire someone face-to-face. He's got to do it by tweet. No. Well, and he's just, I think the mustache just irritated his behind Mm -hmm. during those those monthly praise the dear leader meetings when they all kiss his ass. I think uh, Bolton's mustache finally got to him. Donald Trump played a direct role in setting up the arrangement between his golf resort in Scotland and officials at Glasgow Prestwick Airport. During his campaign, the Pentagon began using the airport to refuel Air Force flights, giving the local airport the job of finding accommodations for flight crews who had to remain overnight. Yesterday, Donald Trump said the deal had, in all caps, nothing to do with me. But documents show both Trump and the Trump organization were directly involved in creating that partnership. That is Donald Trump taking money from the U.S. military and putting it in his pocket. Your money, your tax money goes into his pocket. And if that doesn't bother you, you're probably a Republican. You're probably uh, incredibly wealthy and benefited from the tax cuts. That's that's the deal. Hey, do you want to talk about Rodney Davis for one minute? Sure. Rodney Davis is our Republican congressman. For now. And he wants to ban public financing in campaigns. Not private campaign financing. Not dark money. He wants public financing to be done away with because it leads to swampy things and corruption and God knows what all else. I don't even know what to say to that other than Rodney Davis needs to lose his job next year. We are grateful that uh, our little newspaper had uh, actual letters to the editor, more than one, uh, recalling the history of Ted Nugent's uh, words against Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and pointing out that he's... His death threats, death you threats mean? The death threats? And the, and the yeah. vi- threats of violence and yeah. the uh, comparison to animals and on and on and on. His rhetoric, his rhetoric overall, yes. His draft dodging, his poaching on government lands, his being a, just a really shitty human being all around... Uh, because this is the person that the our local newspaper has hired to be the headline celebrity of their outdoor expo next week. And right. I'm very grateful that they let two letters of protest through the door because the person who runs the paper is not the person who runs the op-ed page. And the person who runs the right. op-ed page is like, right. you know what? We're going to let a couple of people uh, have their say. And they did. And, and actually all who Ted Nugent right. is. Yes. I did check, check the comments on those, and at least a couple of people locally were like, First Amendment, why do you hate the First Amendment? <laughs> like, dude, it's a paid gig at a fucking expo hall for a bunch of people who like to shoot deer, okay? The government right. isn't doing anything to stop him. But, of course, the same right. knuckleheads who think the Second Amendment is, I get to have a bazooka, period, uh, don't understand the First Amendment either. So what do you expect? Yeah, yeah. They also think that the Second Amendment is written on biblical stone. It is. And the First Amendment only applies to them. Yeah. <laughs> Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty is Zoe. And Zoe is standing on her hind legs in this picture doing a penguin impersonation because it is high time for her to have some freshly poured cat food. Freshly poured. I've heard of that. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit or stand upright in this case on the kitchen floor and demand that the cat food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh my Lord, it's freshly poured. And that is our fake sponsor, Freshly Poured Cat Food. You can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go, Postal Unions. Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, even if you buy pumpkin spice, we don't judge. Uh, buy something for us. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. 
We do judge, by the way. We we definitely judge. <laughs> we, don't judge. we don't judge. If people like pumpkin spice, that's okay. Uh, uh. <laughs> I don't think you should buy pumpkin spice hot dogs, but uh, if you want a pumpkin spice coffee, that's okay. Okay. No? <laughs> I, I've, I'm already fighting too many battles. I'm losing blue gal. So I'm not going to take up. You have the... two teenage daughters too, you right. know, who, who might like a pumpkin spice every once in a while. I'm used to I'm losing. blue. Kind of... I'm a liberal. I'm used to losing. Both You're of the used time. to losing. <laughs> Teenage teenage stepdaughters like the pumpkin spice. But here's what I know for sure. Ten yeah. years from now, everybody will be against pumpkin spice. T- yeah. Just mark my words. <laughs> Rick Wilson will have a book about why pumpkin spice is fucking awful. <laughs> no, you got to stop now. You got to stop now. All right. I'm, I'm going to bust done. a gut over Rick Wilson's anti-pumpkin spice book. Mm-hmm. Good Lord. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and I'll bet you can donate to us too. See our website, proleftpod.com for details. We have PayPal, our postal address, so you can mail us an actual check if you want. Uh, we have a thing called Buy Me a Coffee, which lets you just donate one coffee to us. And all kinds of other ways to donate, including swag uh, that you can buy. It's all there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media. And thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, now that the Internet Kitties are polling at 2%, they will definitely be in the next Democratic debate. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGB.